Hello. Welcome back. It's so good to see you. So today I wanted to do kind of a different video than I normally do. I've noticed that a lot of ASMR channels, sometimes they will do ASMR true crime stuff. And I was like, that's kind of cool. Because um, I really like, I like true crime kind of things. Like I'm constantly... Um, watching the Discovery Channel or like biographies and stuff like that on YouTube. Um, so I thought I could do something like that, right? Um, cause like I basically watch those things all the time anyway. Um, but this time I just took notes while I was watching these things and I was reading articles and stuff too. So it's kind of like a big mashup of everything. Um, but I do want to mention if you like these types of videos, please let me know in the comments down below because um, it took a long time for me to get all these notes and stuff. It's like a lot of a lot of work to put these put the information all together. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, if you just let me know if you like it and want me to do more of them, and if you have any suggestions on what you want me to do it on next. Um, but I thought for the first video, I would do it on H.H. H. Holmes. Um, he is the, I don't know, like the, the, the first serial killer in America. Although, I don't like that statement because it's like, he's the first one that was caught or who had notoriety. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure that he was not the first. He's just the first one on record. But anyway, um, yeah, and I don't really know where I want to go with the series either. <laughs> like, if I want to just dedicate it to serial killers, or if I want to do disappearances, or like mystery kind of things, I don't know. But I thought I would just start out with H.H. H. Holmes, because he's the original, you know. Um, but... I do have a side note before I get into it. Um, Hulu has picked up a series um, called Devil in the White City. And I was like, why is it called the White City? Like, I don't understand. But apparently, like, back in the day, um, all their buildings were made out of, like, white stucco. Um, and the streets had these electric lights, so it was just bright white all the time. Um, but yeah, so it's called Devil in the White City, and it's about H.H. H. Holmes, and um, it's going to be starring Leonardo DiCaprio, and it's going to be directed by Martin Scorsese. They were going to make it into a movie, but then Hulu picked it up, and they were like, well, let's do a miniseries. So, um, I think it, it's been on hold because, you know, COVID and everything, but I'm sure they'll be picking it up back soon, and it's like... Yeah, I'm excited to see that. I have a ton of notes, so I don't know how long this this video is going to be. But let's get into it. Okay, so H.H. H. Holmes, also it would be Henry Howard Holmes. He was born on May 16th, 1861 as Herman Webster Mudgett. I can see why he wanted to change his name because it wasn't, it doesn't just roll off the tongue. <laughs> um, okay, so um, his parents, by all accounts, were respectable, nice people, but um, there are rumors that his father was an abusive alcoholic, you know, and even H.H. H. Holmes, you know, commented on that, but he was a pathological liar, so we don't really know what the truth is on that. Um, anyway, so when Holmes was around 13 years old, two older boys um, wanted to scare him. I guess they were just these mean jerks or whatever. <clears throat> so they dragged him into a local doctor's office um, because they knew he was scared of the place um, because there were all these horror stories that were they were like body parts just laying around or whatever, which there weren't, you know, but I don't know. Anyway, and um, 
So they tried to scare him by forcing him to go in there and they made him come face to face and basically just stare at this skeleton and like back in the day skeletons <clears throat> they were made out of real human bones so you know gross um but yeah it was intended you know to scare him or whatever but the more he looked at it he actually became fascinated with the bones and um so much so that he decided that he wanted to go into medicine when he got older. Um, by the age of 16, he fell in love with Clara Lovering while working on her father's farm. Uh, shortly, after, shortly after that, July 4th, 1879, um, they got married. But for the first six months, it was actually kept a secret. I don't know why. Um, they even lived separately, but the secret eventually came out, and Clara's father got Holmes at the time. Herman, but I'm just going to continue to call him Holmes. Um, got Holmes a job in a grocery store that his brother owned. And then about six months later, uh, Clara had a son who they named Robert. After his son was born, Holmes was inspired to go ahead and follow through with his uh, dream of working in medicine. So he quit his job at the grocery store and took up an apprenticeship um, under Dr. Wright, whose office he had been forced to stare at the skeleton. So, um, okay. Uh, during this, during his uh, apprenticeship or whatever, um, Clara and uh, her son, Robert, they moved back in with her parents. Um, about a year after the apprenticeship, he took up studies at a medical school in Burlington, Vermont. Um, during this time, he lived the life of a single man. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he eventually started dating his landlord's daughter, um, but it did come out that he was married, so not everyone was too happy about that. Um, on one occasion, the landlord's wife noticed, like, this horrible smell coming from Holmes's um, apartment, and so she entered the apartment, you know, trying to be like, what is this smell? And underneath his bed, she found, um, the body of a, a dead baby, and, um, so she confronted him about it, and he claimed that it was for school, and he was using it to learn about dissections, um, as part of his homework. Um, yeah, I mean, that could very well be true, um, but I don't think that they would have been like, here's a dead body for you to take home. You know what I mean? They might have had them in the labs or something like that. Um, but I don't think that they would just send home dead bodies. I mean, maybe, but that doesn't seem right to me. Um, but she then warned him never to bring dead bodies into the house again. Not a typical conversation <laughs> that you have with your landlord, you know? Um, okay, so in 1882, uh, Holmes went to Ann Arbor to study at the University of Michigan. This time, he actually took uh, his wife and son with him. Um, but the marriage was not really on the best terms. The people who stayed with them in the, they stayed in a boarding house, so there were other people there. Um, they always complained about, you know, how loud their fights were and stuff like that, and his wife was, like, constantly seen with black eyes, you know, um, but eventually, I guess she had had enough of that, um, so she had, she, uh, returned home with her baby, and the marriage was basically done. I don't think that they ever saw each other again, um, but it was never formalized, like, 
they never actually divorced or anything like that. So after she left, he was left alone and he threw himself into his studies and um, just became super fascinated with the human body and wanting nothing more than to cut human flesh and examine organs. Like so much so that his fellow students later said that his fascination with dissection was just unnatural and unnerving, just super weird and creepy. Um, okay. So, oh, and during his time in college or university, um, there were these stories that Holmes participated in a ruse of, um, faking someone's death and then collecting insurance money. Um, it was claimed that his medical student friends spoke of the idea, but they never actually did it. Some sources say, yes, this was actually true and it happened, and others was like, no, it never happened. So who, who really knows? I don't know. Um, during this time, he began dating a woman in his boarding house, and this woman, she was a widow. And um, he had promised to marry her. He proposed to her. And after he proposed, they, you know, consummated, they didn't actually get married, but, you know, she was like, well, we're getting married, so it's okay. Um, um, but then she found a letter that was written to him from his wife, and she was, like, shocked. She was like, what? But I'm like, at least she didn't find a dead body, you know, like... <laughs> I don't know. Um, but anyway, so she was super upset about this. And she complained to the school, the, the medical school, um, because that was a huge deal to do back then. Like, you could, he, he could have been kicked out of school for that, you know, just, I don't know. Um, but she cited a breach of promise. And, um, uh, Holmes appeared at the hearing in his school, and he claimed that the woman was lying, and, you know, none of the things she said were true, and she was just basically crazy, and he actually had some of his professors speak on his behalf. Well, they believed him, and, um, he was acquitted, so a few months later, he graduated, and after he graduated, he... He spoke to his professors, and they were, he, he was just like, you know that, you know, little thing that I had back then, and I was like, none of that was true, you know, yeah, it was actually true, um, so, got away with it. Like, that's super messed up, right? It's like, if you're gonna be like that, why would you go and tell on yourself, you know, like, it was just, I don't know, it was kind of crazy to do. Okay, so after he graduated, um, he moved back home with his parents in New Hampshire for, for the summer of 1884, and that fall, he began working in New York as a doctor and a teacher. So, I don't know if he worked during the day and night. I don't, I don't know how that would work out. Um, but during this time in New York, he began to get a reputation as a debt defaulter, like he would never pay things, you know, and also a womanizer. Um, and he actually proposed to two women, um, and one of them, I guess neither of them went through, but one of them, Minnie Everett, she backed out and later she was quoted saying, there is something lurking in that man's character that time will reveal. I do not like him. I firmly believe that he would commit murder. I'm like, what happened there? You know what I mean? For her to say that. Because at some point during their relationship, he had asked her to marry him. And she obviously said yes for her to have to back out. So he must have, like, put the charm on in the beginning, but something happened to where she, would, like, took a step back and was like, whoa, this guy's crazy. Like, what did he do to make her think he's crazy and he could kill people? You know what I mean? Like, I have questions. 
<laughs> okay, um, so Holmes, uh, he also got a reputation of being a swindler or like a con man. He would use any excuse to avoid paying his rent, and in the end, he actually had to leave town, um, in the middle of the night to escape the amount of debt that he had collected. Um, but even his, he was able to swindle the price down on his train ticket, um, when he was leaving town. But, so he took a train and he went to Chicago, and it was his intent to find work, um, in a drugstore. But he needed a pharmaceutical license, um, in order to do that. So, he went to Springfield and took a three-day exam, which is crazy, right? I mean, maybe it's still like that. If you're already a doctor, you just need to take an exam to make sure you know about your medicines or something. I don't know. Um, but he took a three-day exam, and back then they put these notices in the press or whatever. Um, but it stated that uh, Henry H. Holmes had passed the bar, and that was actually the first time on record that his alias was used, um, and they say they're like, you know, why he chose that name, you know, who knows, but he changed his name so much, like, he had a lot of different aliases, so that was just probably one of the aliases that he was using at the time, but I'm like, how do you just change your name? Like, he graduated college as a doctor with this name, and then he goes to a different town, and now he has a different name that's still a doctor, like, I just, I know times are different and stuff, but, like, what did he do, just go into the town and be like, yeah, I'm a doctor, I went to this school, and they just took his word for it, like, um, okay, uh, so, by then, um, he actually became a bigamist, I guess, deciding to christen his new name, and he met and married a young woman by the name of Myrta Belknap. Uh, and he says that she was not, she was, like, kind of plain looking. There was nothing really special about her, but her parents had money, so that was good enough for Holmes. Um, shortly after moving to Chicago, he used this money from the marriage to purchase some land, uh, that would be the future site of his murder house. Um, he transferred the ownership into his wife's name and then into his mother-in-law's name to avoid debt collectors. Holmes was then hired by E.S. Holton, and he was a pharmacist that, um, it says he was bedridden, but I think he was, like, sick or something, and he wasn't able to run the pharmacy at the moment. Uh, he wasn't bedridden his whole life or anything, but just at the moment, he needed help. Um, he was hired, so Holmes was hired to take over the business, um, because E.S. Holton's young wife needed help operating the business, um, you know, because she had a kid, but she, she was young, you know, she, that's gotta be hard. Um, shortly after, the couple disappeared with the indication that Holmes murdered them, but this isn't what actually happened. E.S. Holton was also a longshoreman, and when his wife became preg pregnant with her second child, um, it all just became too much f for her and them, so um, they decided to sell their business to Holmes. They never disappeared. That was just rumors. Um, they actually remained in the same neighborhood for basically that whole time well into the 1900s, so. Okay, um, so yeah, he's got this pharmacy business, and it becomes really successful, especially by young women, um, because they wanted to be served by this young, charming, handsome doctor. <laughs> I'm like, was he handsome? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Um, okay, so then he started focusing on the vacant lot that he had purchased, which was actually adjacent from the pharmacy. 
and he had planned to build a two-story building with shops all along the bottom first floor and then residential apartments on the second. The building had some interesting features. There was a hidden compartment between the first and second floors, also a staircase between the floors that could only be reached from a trap door in the second story bathroom. Um, the building was very strange, but the more strange fact was Holmes refused to pay the builders, claiming he wasn't liable um, because the building was actually in his mother-in-law's name. How does that work? I don't know. <laughs> um, so then he claimed that one of the steel beams in the building was too short, and so that voided the contract entirely. Um, he would buy goods on credit and then sell them for cash and then just not pay the bill. Um, yeah, so like this building, and nobody ever knew what the building actually was. Like he would hire a contractor to build one part, like a hallway, and then he would fire them for some reason. Then he would hire somebody else to build like a staircase and then fire them and hire somebody else to build a room and then fire them. So like he was really secretive about it and just weird. And so nobody actually knew what they were working on because they never got to see the plans. He would just tell them do this, they would do it, and then they would get fired. So, um, but one time he bought an enormous safe, like huge, and never paid for it. Um, I guess he bought it on credit. And then when the creditors came to get it back because he never made any payments, uh, he was like, okay, you can have the, the safe back, but you have to promise me one thing, you will not damage my building. And so they were like, okay. But they were unaware that previously he knew that they were coming. So he told a builder or a contractor that they needed to build walls on all sides of this safe so that there was no way in, no way out. So when the creditors went inside looking for it, they weren't able to locate it. And then they realized that it was behind these walls and they had promised not to damage the building. So they felt like they had no other choice but to leave. And I'm like, no way, that would not happen now. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so, um, some people who worked for Holmes said he had, you know, some odd behaviors. Um, he once told a worker to step inside that huge safe and, you know, shut the door and start yelling because he wanted to see if it was soundproof. That's weird, right? Um, and his housekeeper would regularly catch him, like just sneaking around and tiptoeing at night so and then um a janitor who actually worked in the pharmacy recalled a time when holmes uh showed him a collection of fake beards and disguises it's like i i wish that there was more documentation about that because i would like to talk to that janitor like how did that conversation happen and like, what was your reaction? And like, what was his explanation for these weird disguises and fake beards and stuff? You know what I mean? Like, I need more details. <laughs> um, okay, so Holmes decided to sell the drugstore in order to focus on real estate or murder house. And uh, shocking, it was another con. Um, after the new owner took possession so the owner came the the new well ugh. so Holmes was trying to sell this pharmacy and he had you know it looked like a pharmacy there were shelves and you know counters everything that a pharmacy has and the guy who bought it was like man this is great you know he was like what a 
what a good deal, you know, and all this. So the guy bought it. And then shortly after the guy bought it, he set up a shop, you know. And then all of a sudden, these creditors started coming in and they were like, hey, uh, what's going on? Because all the, everything in this, in this store, in this pharmacy, Holmes had bought on credit and it was never paid. So the creditors, like, had to take all that back. So the person who bought the pharmacy was just like, out of luck. Um, but somehow when he confronted Holmes about it, um, somehow Holmes was able to talk his way around it. I'm like, how, how does that work? You know, like this guy must've just been like such a smooth talker, you know, like I would like to have seen him work. You know what I mean? I don't know. Um, okay, so, yeah, so he was, he, he was able to work his way around, you know, like, oh, yeah, everything in the building is not actually part of the building, um, but he was still able to spend time at the pharmacy, and one day he was, um, he was there when one of the new investors for the new owner had showed up with important information to share with the new owner. Um, but mysteriously, the man collapsed outside the drugstore, and Holmes was the first one at his side, and was seen pouring a dark liquid down the man's throat. Within minutes, that man was dead. Hmm. What was that dark liquid? Um, this, they say this was likely that the first that this was the first person to die at the hands of Dr. Holmes, um, killed likely because he knew too much about Holmes and was going to give the information to the new owner, but we'll never know what the information really was because he's dead. Awful. Um, okay, so, um, bef I guess before he had sold the pharmacy, or just shortly after, or whatever, um, Holmes had employed a young couple, Ned and Julia Connor, who had worked in the pharmacy, and they also lived in the second floor of his recently completed building. And within a month, shock, Holmes and Julia started an affair. Even though, you know, both of their spouses lived under the same roof as well, um, but uh, Julia's husband, Ned, found out and was, you know, furious. So he quit at the pharmacy and he filed for divorce against Julia. So Holmes and Julia grew closer and he even listed her as a co-founder of uh, numerous businesses and he took out a lot of loans under her name. Um, then on July 4th, 1891, Julia and her eight-year-old daughter, Pearl, disappeared. The bodies were never discovered, and Holmes never confessed to murdering them. But it seems quite likely that they were his next victims. I don't know if they actually were. I mean, there's just not a lot of records of people, you know? But... I mean, they could have been. I just don't understand why he wouldn't confess to their murders because he confesses to lots of murders later on. Why wouldn't he confess to theirs, you know? Um, anyway, so around the same time, Holmes started a glass bending company. Knowing nothing about glass bending, uh, he convinced anyone who would listen that he invented a new, unique glass bending technique and to perfect it he needed to build a furnace in the basement of his two-story building and he made a big deal about it um, but no one ever saw him bend any glass like ever so yeah weird um, after the establishment of his basement furnace the disappearance of young women who came into his circle um, became more common, one being um, Emmeline Chigrand, I don't know, who came to Chicago looking for work um, in 
1892, um, Holmes employed her as a typewriter girl and soon realized that she was getting a little bit too much of his money. Um, and then the girl disappeared around Christmas. But Holmes dismissed it with what was to become a common explanation. She's gone to Europe to get married. It's like the 1800s. Who can just go to Europe? You know what I mean? Like, how did she meet her husband in Europe? Why do people not ask questions back then? I don't, I don't understand. Okay, so in 1892, the whole city was excited about the World's Fair. And um, it was a celebration of the 400th anniversary of Columbus landing in Americas. Um, but Holmes saw this as more of an opportunity and quickly had a third story built onto his building to serve as a hotel. However, he never really intended to use the floor as a hotel. It was more just like a money scheme um, because it, it allowed him to buy, to do more buying things on credit and then selling them for cash and then not paying the bills. And then he got um, investors to invest in the hotel part of the building. Um, but he never intended on paying his investors back because his full plan was to set the building on fire and collect on the insurance claim and then he wouldn't have to pay the, in the investors back or anything like that. Um, there are stories that the hotel was flourishing during the World's Fair and he lured countless women to their death but there are no records that he even took a single paying customer in the hotel. Um, when he did set the fire to the building, uh, it was August 13th, 1893, um, you know, to claim the insurance. Uh, the only people that were actually on site were the long-term residents on the second floor. There was never any guests on the third floor. Um, but the resulting insurance claim would spend years in courts, by which time Holmes would be behind bars. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. So, with just mounting lawsuits and debt, Holmes decided that it was time to get out of Chicago. And he traveled all over. Uh, he went to Denver, Fort Worth, St. Louis, and finally Philadelphia. Along the way, he got married once more, um, this time to a 23-year-old with a $2,000 inheritance. Her name was Minnie Williams. Then he became a friend with a like-minded con um, by the name of Benjamin Peitzel. Peitzel got himself arrested shortly after um, for writing bad checks, you know, so he had to spend some time in jail. Um, but Holmes agreed to begin paying the premiums on Peitzel's life insurance policy. Peitzel was released from jail and the two joined forces again and bought a vacant lot in Fort Worth. Um, here they planned to build a replica of the Chicago building. Just like the original building, the hotel featured a number of secret passages and strange twists, but what Holmes planned to do with the building is unclear, but I'm pretty sure we know what he wanted to do with the building. <laughs> Um, he didn't hang around long enough to actually use it, um, but what him and Peitzel did do was take out tens of thousands of dollars in mortgages on it and then disappeared without making hardly any payments on it. Okay, so the two cons moved to St. Louis where Holmes bought a drugstore for a down payment of $50. That's nuts. Um, and promissory notes that were completely worthless. Um, Peitzel then approached a drugstore supplier and convinced them that um, he was interested in buying the drugstore from Holmes. If they would lend him the money, he would use them as his um, main supplier. Well, they agreed, but the con was immediately revealed the next day when the drugstore rep called 
only to find that the place was closed and he got suspicious um, so he called the authorities. Holmes was arrested and spent three days in jail. Okay, so after his release, Holmes went to Philadelphia and to the con that would ultimately be his undoing. Here he planned to make good on those insurance premiums he had paid for for his friend Peitzel a few months previous. The two men had been planning together to defraud the insurance company by faking Peitzel's death and then splitting the proceeds. In early September, however, Peitzel got cold feet and was like, nah, I, I really don't want to do that. And um, he wanted to back out. Well, Holmes was very, very upset with this. And so he was like, look, let me just come over tomorrow. We can talk about it. Let's, let's see what we can work out, you know? So the next day, he goes to discuss the issue. And when he gets to Peitzel's home, Holmes begins drinking, Peitzel begins drinking, and then Holmes knocks out Peitzel with a chloroform handkerchief, and he does it continually until his friend is dead. Holmes then attempted to stage the scene to make the death look accidental. Then he took his wife on a train, headed for Indianapolis, with the intent of collecting the $10,000 insurance payment only to find out that the payment was made to Peitzel's wife. But Holmes convinced the widow that her late husband died, owing him $7,500 for the building in Texas. Well, she believed him, and she handed the money over. Um, but she actually needed her children to go... I don't know, to some other state or whatever, but he said, if you give me the $75,000, I'll take your kids to where they need to go. I'm like, you don't even know this man, and, like, you're just handing your kids over? What? Mm. But anyway, um, so she was like, yes, you know, take the children and, um, to go see their aunt. So, afterwards, Holmes had left with the kids and he was headed to wherever, I can't remember where it was, um, to take them to their aunt, but on their travels, he realized that he was a wanted man in several states and that the authorities would very much like to talk to him. Um, so now he's officially on the run and he ended up, um, not being able to directly deliver the children, you know, they had to go all over the country to avoid the authorities, um, but at some point, this became too much, and he decided, you know what, these kids are gonna have to die, it's like, why, why do they have to die, why can't you just abandon them, like, abandoning the kids would be less terrible than murdering them, um, anyway, it, I think there was a boy and two girls. The youngest was eight years old, uh, and his name was Howard. Howard was poisoned with cyanide, and the other two girls were most likely gassed to death. The bodies were buried in a cellar. By then, detectives were hot on the trail <laughs> and finally caught up with him in Boston and actually arrested him for horse theft um, with a bunch of other little charges to follow, and in October 1895, um, Holmes was convicted of murdering Benjamin Peitzel. Holmes eventually confessed to murdering 27 people, and was hanged on May 7th, 1896, and his dying wish was for his body to be buried under 10 feet of concrete to prevent grave robbers from stealing and dissecting his body, something that he did himself, so, but yeah, so that's his story, but like, his life seemed like it was so long, but he was only 34 years old, 34 years old, and he was a doctor, a pharmacist, a landowner, a murderer, 
a bigamist. He was married four times. He was a traveler and a con man. Just, I have so many questions. Like, what was his childhood actually like? And, you know, because he seems like he was a really smart man. He just used his brain for evil instead of good. You know what I mean? Um, but it's like, where was the turning point in his life? Was it that whole skeleton thing? Like, what if he was never forced to look at the skeleton? Because before the skeleton, he wasn't fascinated. He was like grossed out and freaked out by bodies and you know what I mean? And then because those boys forced him to look at the skeleton, you know, he became fascinated. Well, what if that wouldn't have happened? How would he, would he still be the same person? I just, I don't know, it's just very interesting to me. But yeah, um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and again, if you're still watching, um, yeah, let me know if you want me to do another one, um, what kind of topic you want it on, or person, you know, just let me know. Yeah, so thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you have a great day.